We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. With the COVID-19 pandemic still in full effect, and most of us under stay-at-home orders, there are many of us who are stuck with no way to game. And there's the, some of us who, that, while getting in a bit of gaming with family, are missing out on regular game nights and aren't gaming nearly as much as we normally would. That, and there are some of us that are doing plenty of gaming still, but still need some way to fill in the time between game sessions, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Worthwhile, gaming-related things you can do that aren't playing games. All right, tonight we're going to be giving you some suggestions of things you can do between game sessions or between games. These include things that are just good for keeping you busy, as well as some things that you can do that'll be for the benefit of your future game sessions. These are all things that I enjoy doing between game sessions when I can get together, or when I can't get together with my regular group or on weekends when there's no local gaming events or when I'm stuck at home for an extended period of time. This is something, um, I, I don't know who coined the term, but I always like the term. It's what I call gaming's lonely fun. Now, if you're isolated with another gamer, these can still be group activities if you're both burned out on games. Yeah. All right, first thing you can do, because everyone loves to do this and play protected, is sleeve your cards. Now, I'm not personally a big card sleever myself. I prefer to play unprotected. But this is something that many gamers will do before they play their first game, that includes any cards whatsoever, small cards, big cards, little cards, tarot sized cards. You can get sleeves for all types of cards. Fantasy Flight even has them color coded and you can get their own brands of cards. Sleeving cards I find can be quite zen and relaxing. For me, it's something I do while in front of the TV or while listening to podcasts. I need something else in the background and then I just kind of mindlessly sleeve in cards. Definitely something that's hardly engrossing, but for many people, a vital detail to extend the life of their games. All right, another one. This one takes up a lot more time, can be almost a hobby in itself, and that is building box inserts. One of our first podcast episodes ever, this goes way back, is on whether we thought box inserts were worth it or not. And our final decision at the time was basically, if it means you're going to get the game to the table more often, it's worth building a box insert for it. And some games are so fiddly to put away and take out that a box insert makes a game that's got a half hour set up now set up in minutes. Now, there are all kinds of box inserts out there. You can buy them online from a variety of companies. Uh, the two most well-known out there, some of the first companies and still some of the best, are Meeple Realty and Broken Token. They do wooden inserts. Then there's Folded Space. They do much cheaper foam core inserts. There's Zen Bins that does plastic. Plus, if you head to Etsy, there are all kinds of independent shops doing wood, foam, and even 3D printed inserts. Now, if you have lots of time on your hand and you're a little more crafty than say maybe i am maybe now's the time to try building your own insert now you can wing it and just try to make your own but if you head over to board game geek there are many people there who have uploaded and share their own patterns for making box inserts uh, if you have access to foam core in particular mm -hmm. this seems to be the go-to material for many of the diy uh, folks on the bgg forums as it is much easier to work with than custom cutting wood uh, as Mo mentioned earlier, Folded Space uses foam core inserts, and we don't mean they're cheaper as in cheap, cheaply no. made. They're just cheap because they're less expensive because foam core is easier to work with than wood. Uh, yep. Also, as a big bonus with foam core, it's less likely to warp permanently over time, mm -hmm. though it's admittedly also not as sturdy and resilient as wood is generally. Yeah, another advantage of foam core, which I didn't think of at first, is how much lighter it is. Some of those bigger games, once you throw the insert in, holy cow, like my copy of Caverna, you could kill someone with that thing. Well, I mean, Gloomhaven was big enough to begin with. Before well, it already you was, a, yeah. A, before you put a wooded, a wooden insert in it. <laughs> yes. yes. All right, next, organize your existing games. Organize a specific game. So even if you're not going to necessarily build a box insert, there are very few games out there that couldn't benefit from some type of organization inside the box. Now, this could just mean grabbing some resealable plastic bags, Ziploc bags, whatever you want to call them, or going as far as getting a Plano container or resealable containers or things to hold individual components. 
or very th various other things that are out there to, to organize components, like using, say, even pill bottles to hold things. There are lots of different options out there. Uh, Plano in particular, there is a, I'm going to throw this in the show notes, there is a board game geek, geek list for what Plano for which game. And they have, like, almost every game out there that you'd want to put a Plano in, it's which Plano to buy. And for people who don't know, Plano is a type of uh, organizer, kind of like fishing tackle box. Now, a pro tip, though, and one I should listen to myself, is if you're going to go with baggies or any of this, label it. Grab a permanent marker and write down what goes in what. That way, when you're cleaning up, everyone knows where everything goes and belongs. This is something, if I could find the time, I need to do. I baggy all my stuff. I plan out some stuff. I throw stuff in containers. But I never actually take the time to write down that time, that, that what goes where. Yep. I'm sure there are plenty of folks out there who have pulled a box off the shelf only to open it up mm -hmm. and despair of getting it back onto the table because of how it was put away. This is, this is a perfect time to get it set right so that you can look at the box and think of playing it with joy and not dread. I remember some of the early gaming events. I don't know if I should mention the specific gamers, but there was a particular gamer who bought the big uh, Fantasy Flight, tons of miniatures, tons of counters games, and their cleanup method was literally put the box at the edge of the table and swipe. Ooh. And I was just like, oh, my God, how could you <laughs> do that? It's so I mean, awful. it's great for the end of the day, but it's horrible oh, for the start of the like, next one. And like, that's it, and that's how they would set up, is they would basically do the the, the Tom Dra Fassel drop. They would sit there and turn the box upside down and lift it up, and then all the players would start sorting through and grabbing their own colors and stuff. And I was uh, just like, oh. It, it gives me shivers just yeah, thinking no, that's, about it. That's not good. That's not good. And these are big games, like like Twilight Imperium, Chaos in the Old World, oh. lots of miniature games. Like, oh, it was insane. All right, up next. Um, organize. We, we talked about organizing a specific game. How about organizing your whole collection? Besides just fixing the one, take everything off your shelves and put them back, basically. We, we have an entire episode about this. Again, I'll throw it in the show notes. I didn't bother grabbing episode numbers for this tonight but um we have all kinds of suggestions like there were some really interesting ones actually um alphabetical by genre by publisher by theme by player count like all kinds of interesting ways to organize your game collection so that when you're trying to decide what to play it's either easier to find or you reduce your collection to a subset so you're like i have four people we head to the four player shelf for the four player room depending on how big or small your collection is Though, if you're one of those people who organize your shelves by color, and I have seen your pictures on Twitter, you <laughs> might have too much time, even in a lockdown, even before the lockdown situation. That's where you start rearranging it so it's not Roy G. Biv, but into some other color combination. <laughs> you know, you do the color wheel instead yeah, or something. Yeah, no, I, I've seen a couple of those, and yeah, I don't yeah, understand I've... how those people exist. I, I just don't. How do you find a game with it? <laughs> it, it looks great. The thing it is, does... if I did something like that, what I would do is I would have a catalog. I, I would have some kind of like, I don't know, binder or whatever I would grab and I would look up Robo Rally and it would say gray or first <laughs> printing red or second printing green because, well, that's actually the colors. Yeah. Or you could just be like me and actually remember what color every box of games come in. I don't think I remember all of them though. <laughs> all right, let's say you're going to do this. You're going to rearrange your collection. This is also a good time to call your collection. Go through the games you own and see if you really need to own all of them. Has one game replaced another game, so you'll never play the original anymore, sometimes called the Jones Theory? Are there games that you find broken or that you've solved? Like, you know what? We played that so many times. Every time we play, the person who plays, I'm going to use an example of Dominion. Oh, yeah, the big money thing. Without expansions, you just go big money and big money wins. I'm sick of playing Dominion because every time we play, Dave plays big money. Or do you have legacy games that you finished or one-shot games, right? Uh, we'll be talking about one later tonight, one of the exit games. Do we still have the box for that game here? Do we need it? Why Why not get rid of it? Now, what you do with them is up to you. Actually, it's one of the topic suggestions we've gotten is how to call and what to do with games. I don't know if we'll ever deep dive into it, but just quickly, I'd say you could sell them. You can donate them to local libraries or schools, which I think is a better suggestion, depending on how badly you need the money. If you need the money, sell them. That's totally fine. Use it to buy more games. Um, trade them with other people. Get part in a mass trade. But with what's going on right now with the pandemic, just because of what's going on right now, I would actually suggest offering them to other locals who may not have much of a gaming library to give them something to do. Like this is a chance to contact your neighbors and say, hey, do you people play board games? You know what? I'm going to drop this off on your porch. Check it out. Or if you're actually socializing with some close people, close to you people, 
perhaps you give them the game and show them how to play, but you could offer to do it over Skype or something like that if it's something a little more complicated. Just remember that the virus lives for a day on cardboard and three days on plastic. So if you pass on a game, remember to suggest you get isolated for a few days just to be safe. Yeah, or at least wipe it down, right? Like, make sure they wipe it down. But yeah, what's if if you if the person didn't have much of a game collection, I'm sure they can wait one more day before trying up something else. Now, another way to um, improve the games you have. So this is something you can do in your downtime to make the games you own better, and that is to find or create some player aids. Uh, this could be anything. This could be reference cards, scoring sheets, turn summaries. Uh, we've mentioned Esoteric Order of Gamers many times in the show, and I still do strongly recommend them, but they have not done every game. Uh, Board Game Geek, almost every game I've ever looked up has some kind of rule summary out there, except Shafosa. That was the one exception. Proves the rule. Uh, personally, I would do that. I would check Esoteric, and I would check Board Game Geek first, but that's just so you're not recreating the wheel. You're not working on something that's already been done. But the other thing you could do, too, is if you've got the time, is find all multiples of these and create a best of whatever's most useful for your group. Especially if you're teaching games, uh, you're the game teacher. The other thing you can work on is teaching sheets. Now, I know Edward from Heavy Cardboard actually offers his online, and that's literally his script he uses while teaching games. Now, you could use Edward's or you can create your own. But these are all things you can do that you're going to spend time now that's going to make your time when you game more enjoyable, run better, run faster, and make the games, get more games to the table. Well, another great solution for games you might not get to the table often enough for dread of teaching or rule memory. All right, another one. Uh, this kind of goes with cards leaving. I probably could have put it in together, but I didn't think of it at the same time, is to protect the components of the games you have. Uh, now that you got player aids that you just printed off, you created some shiny new player aids, laminate them. At the same time, laminate those roll and write sheets. Laminate a scorecard. Why burn through that pad? If you're ever worried about you running out the pad, just laminate one of them. Throw in some dry erase, wet erase markers, whatever you prefer to use in the box. And then the next time you go to play, you don't have to worry about running out of character sheets. Uh, RPG side, character sheets, monster stat cards, um, people who play like War Machine Hordes, you can laminate those cards to take them off. Miniature gamers, you got your army sheets. Pretty much there's anything you're going to write on is worth laminating, plus anything that you worry about is going to get damaged. So if it's thin. So another example is like the, the player boards in Terraforming Mars. If you haven't got the new awesome upgraded ones from Board Game Geek or the Kickstarter, you still got the old school ones. They're worth laminating just because they're pretty thin and they can get easily damaged. Now, along with that, there's other things you could do, like Red Meeple Ryan in our chat room has recommended many times is coin capsules. These are perfect for small chits, whether it's money or resources or corn and Zolkin or whatever. These are small round capsules for holding coins, collectible coins that you can put your game components in. Another one, this one I learned from um, Snakes and Lattes in Toronto, is using Tester's Dull Coat on your boards. So you get some spray varnish and hit your game boards, and if you wish, your player pieces, your meeple, your wooden tokens and stuff like that, just to give them that extra level of coating. Now, no Tester's Dull Coat. Some people do claim yellows over time, but it does take 20 to 30 years. So if you think you're going to be playing your game for that long, Fair enough, you may not want to use it, but there aren't a lot of games I own that I play that long. And again, if I've played a game for 30 years, unless it's a, a collector's item, it's time to go buy a new copy of Catan or whatever that popular game is. Uh, though if you don't already have a laminator, you might want to hold off a bit and wait for a sale or stores to reopen rather than shipping things like that around uh, unnecessarily. All right, up next is painting, miniature painting. Uh, my camera's not quite at the right angle to show off all the unpainted miniatures I have, but you know what? All those Games Workshop boxes back there are filled with them too. Um, many of today's most popular games include miniatures. Miniatures are now a common feature of game, and they aren't necessarily always figures. They could be resources. They could be buildings. They could be anything. Plastic pieces have pretty much replaced wood in a lot of games. Plus, even wooden pieces could use a bit of paint and sprucing up. This is uh, painting miniatures, a long-time hobby of mine, something I started way back in the 80s, something I find extremely relaxing and zen. It takes up a lot of time, because personally, I find when I'm painting, the time just flies by. Like, I don't realize how much has gone by. Now, you don't have to be any good to improve the overall look of a game. Miniatures are going to be more than arm's length away in general when you're playing a game. They don't have to look perfect. Now, if you're not willing to go whole hog and totally paint your miniatures, the other thing to suggest is just putting an ink wash on your miniatures. 
or doing what they call a dip is another a, a more modern term for it. And that'll really help a miniature pop where you just add some darkness into the recesses and really get to just see the, the details on the miniatures without having to, you know, paint the cloak and paint the things all different colors and make them look like they're supposed to and everything like that. Yeah, if some of the hosts of this show were actually not working still throughout yeah. this, they could certainly take this advice and make some good oh. use of it. Oh, I definitely would. Imperial Assault would probably be where I'd start. Start painting some Stormtroopers, start with Stormtroopers, move on, and then once my, my skills have uh, gotten back to what they used to be, at least, if not better, start working on, like, characters, because I wouldn't want to try to start with a Han Solo, but, you know, a bunch of bunch of white and black Stormtroopers to start. And also, Danielle in the chat room is pointing out that craft stores with curbside pickup and some bulk stores do carry laminators, so. Yep. Uh, technically, office supply stores are considered essential, so they are open. Uh, well, in, in Ontario, they are anyway. In I'm Ontario, sure yeah, it's depending, true, depending on where you're at. But um, Staples would have, they, I don't know if they do curbside or delivery. All right, talking about painting miniatures leads me to blinging out your board games. Your favorite game doesn't have minis. It has meeples. Maybe go get some minis or find some minis for it. Or swapping those resource cues for 3D printed resources or resources made of clay. Uh, Stonemeyer Games is famous for putting out these resin and clay resource replacements. That round marker in the networks is just a little peg. Wouldn't it be so much cooler if it was a small TV from a dollhouse set? Just think of things you could do to make your games look cooler. Scoring, scoring markers and vinos as little mini wine bottles instead of cubes. There are all kinds of cool things you can do to improve the table presence of your existing games to just make them pop. And I've got to say, I personally find the games more engaging when you have these things. Yeah, so and supporting artists on Etsy. If you can't figure out or don't have the resources to make adjustments yourself is a great way to help people make it through these tough times. Though we're also aware that you may be having some of those tough times yourself right now. Yeah, very fair. Yeah, Etsy has all kinds. Almost any board game you search for, you'll find some kind of improvements. If you've got a friend with a 3D printer right now, and if they're bored, you could totally give them lots of stuff to do. All right, something else that I find useful to do between game sessions is refreshing myself on the rules. This is the perfect time to figure out if you've been playing your games correctly or playing the extreme version. Once I get a new game, after the first play, I'd like to review the rules, see what's next, what I messed up. There's always something. After about two, three more plays, no matter how much time has passed, I usually like to go back at least once more and check the rules again. Usually by the time I get to two, three plays, sometimes it's just two weeks later, I'll take a look at it. And it is amazing how many games I have played wrong and just little rules I've missed. Now with RPGs, I find this even more important because most RPGs have thick, tome-like rule books and it's almost impossible for someone to remember all the rules. Every few sessions, I actually like to take out my core rule books for whatever game I'm running and at least flick through it with a focus on stuff I know is coming up. For example, if I know in the next adventure my players are going to be getting on a boat, it's time to check those naval travel times and the rules for swimming and drowning. Well, I mean, if you want to read them from cover to cover, go ahead. We're not going to say not to, but it's really what we're talking about is refreshing new concerning or upcoming details for uh, for current plays. And especially we talked about um, at some point rulings over rules and just making a call with it and whether a house in our episode of a house rule. And this is that that chance too that once you made a house rule, go back and check what the actual rule is. Now along with RPGs, there's your regular session prep. One of the things that make uh, RPGs different than board games is the fact that there is work to do while you're not actually playing the game. And this can be for both the, the DM, GM, and the players, depending on what exact game you're playing. But there's all kinds of time you can spend to prep for the next game. Now, what I would do is, thinking of this, like expanding on time, there's warm room to prep. This is where I'm going to map some dungeons, maybe make a relationship map, stat out some NPCs, create new monsters, maybe even make some props for your game. This is where you think, you know what, my game's great and it's going really well, but you know what would make it over the top is to do X and then sit there and do that X, that extra thing that's just going to make the game even better next time. Yeah, and with online gaming, there's all sorts of scripting and things you can get into with Roll20 and other systems. So you can maybe take things to the next level if you've just so far been doing the same sort of thing you would at the table, but using an online system. You know, there, there's other levels you can take it to if you if you really want to delve into that. Yeah. 
Now, another suggestion RPG related is to make your own DM screen or GM screen, depending on which, which term you prefer. I personally like having a screen. I don't sit behind it. I sit beside it, but I like having the useful information in front of me. But what I found over time, especially when I first, like I, I companies seem to be really good at giving you the info you need when you first start running a game. The thing is, once I've run a game for a year or even two months or even five sessions, some of that stuff I find I don't need. Meanwhile, there's something I keep looking up in the book every session. So now's the time to make your own screen. Now, there's lots of things out there online for how to make your own DM screen, but mainly you're just going to sit there and go through and find the tables, charts, things you need, the reminders, random sets of NPC names, whatever you find is useful for you at the table. Now, this can also go for players. Though you don't see it often, Dungeons Dragons actually published them player screens for each of the things. So if you were a fighter, it had all the weapons and it had all the feats listed and it had all the stuff just for fighters on there and all the special moves, right? The trip and sunder and trip and how all those work. Trip, sunder, I don't even remember all the different moves. Push, the five-foot shove. Now I'm thinking 3.5 rules here, but whatever edition it happens to be. And those, like, they came out and I think people didn't like them and they never went anywhere, but I think they're brilliant. I think player screens are just as valid as DM screens. Though your DM might get excited if you try to roll behind the screen, but then your DM shouldn't be rolling behind the screen that often either. But that's a matter of personal preference. I personally think player aids aren't just for board games and can be just as valid for role-playing games. Absolutely. I mean, it depends. Some people might consider uh, their player sheet a, 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 a player screen mm. of a sort. Some, some of the character sheets really get in-depth and have a lot of that information on there. So if you've got, you know, a three-page character sheet, you may have all that character information on there. Or maybe you want to build yourself a new character sheet that has all that information on there. Um, there's a million character sheets out there. Making your own to be a million and one isn't a bad thing if it's got the information you need right there in front of you. It's going to make the game flow smoother. And that means you can be more creative and focus less on the roles and more on your role. Plus, even the act of doing it is going to help you remember those rules. That's always just the, the, the physical act of going through this. And the same thing for making the board game uh, player aids. It's just doing it is going to help you remember the rules for the game more. All right, how about you got lots of time? Again, I'm thinking RPGs mainly here because they're the ones you need to do this for. you got a ton of time. Why not learn a new system? Now, there are many of us, and I think our chat room mostly falls along in this vein, that jump around from RPG system to RPG system playing various one-shots, trying out different systems all the time, but there are a large number of RPG gamers out there that stick to what they know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I have no problem with it. I know people who just play AD&D 2nd Edition have since the 90s and don't plan on ever changing. But you know what? A period of downtime between campaigns or while we're stuck socially isolating is the perfect time to try something new. Learn a new system. Read the rules. Make some sample characters. Run through a mock adventure. Look online for solo adventures. Come back to your group excited about something new and interesting when you can get together again. Break out something completely from surprise. Though, again, get buy-in. Like, let people know before we start, no, I'm going to kill our old campaign and we're trying something new. Get that enthusiastic buy-in before you start going. But now's the time. Like, if you've had that DCC rule book, which I got to say, the things like this stick, sitting on your shelf, and you're like, man, I always wondered. Or in my case, like, role master. If I had, if again, if I wasn't working, if I had the time painting miniatures and like learning to play role master would be a good goal for me at this point. Cause I have had the role master standard system since my friend Al McDade bought it for me in 1990s with the promise I had to run it for him someday. And I never did follow through on that. You know, and now's the time to do it and then get a hold of Al on Skype and run some role master for him. Well, and another uh, uh, op option is finding some actual play campaigns, either in video or in audio mm -hmm. form which can help you get into that new system. And it also helps to support those creators as well. Yep, very true. All right, the last one I've got on the list uh, for today, and I'm sure there are more, we'll be checking in with the lobby to see what they have. I saw a couple scroll by as we were talking, is to play games, but solo games, games for yourself, right? You can't get together with your regular group. You can't get to your, your weekend game nights canceled. There's no local gaming events, just you. There are many solo games out there. Now, these can include solo board games. So what I was kind of thinking here as something different was setting up a multiplayer game and playing multiple sides or fighting through an RPG combat where you control all the combatants or doing any of those things where you're just to, to, to learn a rule system or to learn a game for the first time. It's a great way is to play or to improve your skill. 
Like you've seen it many, many times where people play both sides in chess to get better at playing chess. That's just as valid with other board games. That way you're ready to go and ready to kick butt when you get back to your normal group. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, if you check in on Board Game Geek, many isolated gamers have come up with solo variants for games oh, yeah. that weren't originally intended that way to give you other options. As well, uh, game uh, systems like the uh, Tabletop Simulator allow mm -hmm. you to play well as multiple players, essentially, if you'd like to. So you can set up a game with four players of Azul and play Azul to, to get better if, if, you're, if you really want to. Uh, yep. There's a lot of options out there uh, either built, designed in the game, or figured out by other people to let you uh, work on your strategies. Plus, RPGs too. There are a growing number of solo RPGs. They used to be very rare. Like there was two or three, and you could, I could name them all. It's been a long time since then. There are a number, a growing number of solo RPGs out there nowadays. There are a lot of games that you can play by yourself. And of course, the last one, though, this gets into now you're playing games with your friends is play online. But that gets into a totally different topic, one we will try to tackle at a future segment. Well, now that we're done with our thoughts on the main topic, we're going to head over to the lobby. We're diving to answering your questions live. Uh, Ryan mentions uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know, as an option for... Uh, as an option for your, your DM screen, you can just use three iPads with different uh, content. Well, if you happen to have three iPads, <laughs> it's not a terrible idea if you have them. Like, I have one. I... Oh, and Mo's locking up on us as soon as we go into the lobby. The lobby does not like Mo tonight. Wow. No idea what he's saying. Not at all. Some neat stuff where they, oh, they pulled and over, you're back. pulled everything you're back in place. Now. You were completely gone. All right. We have no idea what you said. Uh, that sauce. And you're shrunk. At least I waited till the lobby. It waited till the lobby. It did. It doesn't matter. Waited. Don't we leave the lobby in at this point? Usually we do, yes. Yeah. Oh, what is going on tonight? All right, so I, I noted, I noted uh, owning three iPads would be a, a bit surprising. But basically, I made my own DM screen. There was this thing that used two binders, and there was two ring binders. And it used um, sleep, sleep protectors. Sleep, protectors. sleep protectors. And it used binder clips. And the binder clips held the binders together. But they were also, like, they put them in smart places so that, like, the metal piece that you flip up would hold your sheets in place so they don't, like, flap in the wind and everything. Right. And it worked great. And then they used the binders where you could slide stuff in. So the front side was supposed to be player stuff. And then the DM side was ones you could flip and you could flip the pages. But, like, you would flip the page, but then you would use these blinder clips to hold it in place. Like, it was actually really brilliant. And you know what? If I can find the YouTube video, I'll throw it in the in the show notes. Uh, this was a long time ago. <laughs> like, YouTube was still pretty new at the time. And the person was running some uh, anarchy cyberpunk game that made them. But it... Yeah. I made a... Uh, so what else we got? Uh, solo tic-tac-toe. There we go. Uh, <laughs> Cat's Dream is a good one for solo. Sorry, what was? Cat's Dream, uh, Mage Kale is saying, good one for solo RPG. All right, I saw Red Meeple Ryan had like seven different things to do. Uh, yeah, yep. Uh, he, was, he was trying to see how many of them uh, that we did. Uh, I don't know how close we got. I know last uh, week you... Shop on online phone. for component upgrade bits. Chat on social media about games and gaming. Start That's a game it. podcast. You know what? Go online. Talk to other people about gaming. That is definitely something you can do. There are multiple discords out there. There's Facebook and Twitter, though I don't know how much you want to be on those. They can be a bit toxic at times. Uh, Discord generally tends to be, I find, uh, at least you join a, 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 what would you call it, directed, a specific, a themed Discord channel. So far, and well moderated. Those are worth doing. Yep. Uh, Cat Stream is apparently inspired by Studio Ghibli. Cool. Start uh, a podcast. There you go. That Anchor Cast is supposedly really simple to get started with, but they own all your stuff. So if you're okay with people owning your content, other than you, Anchor Cast I hear is the way to go. I also hear it's really easy to monetize. Danielle is uh, currently doing a GM boot camp to be on a demo team for a system and learning for another system so that she can write for that system soon and for community fair, content. Fair, cool. Way to keep, uh, way to keep busy. To on the, write your own game. That could totally go on the list. 
Yep. Thousand times. Sit down, write your own role playing game. Either either from scratch or join one of the many game jams that are going on right now. There's always so many of those happening. Um, I think Itchio I think seems to be a place where a lot of people are doing some game jam stuff. I'm not uh, super familiar with uh, what's going on over there, but I see a lot of uh, content creators talking about it and using it. Yeah, Itch is very popular. That's where a lot of the people we used to follow on drive through are now on Itch. Right. Yeah, make your own game. Write your own game. Create your own game. That Roger should be in the chat. He's all about making his own games. <laughs> all righty. All right, I think we're good. 